Welcome to this edition of Cranmer Readings. We pick up with Alan Weatherall, Cranmer, theologian, archbishop, and martyr. Separation, November 1532. The time when Cranmer was recalled back to England. You've received a letter from the king, Musen C. Nach England, Zurukgehen. Do you have to go back to England? Cranmer was surprised that his wife had already heard of the letters, but it seemed that the news of an important arrival from England circulated even more quickly than expected. While his wife took off her cloak, Cranmer ex tried to explain what they might best do in the light of the new king's instructions. Although they had discussed different eventualities before their unorthodox marriage, Cranmer had not raised with his wife the possibility that he might become Archbishop of Canterbury. Cranmer and Marguerite had met earlier that year, only a few months previously. Cranmer's responsibilities required him to travel with the Emperor's court in the summer of 1532. The emperor had been in Nuremberg and negotiating with the Lutheran states for the support of his ongoing battle with the Ottoman Empire. Nuremberg was an independent city, one of the earliest cities in Germany to decide to declare itself Lutheran. Lutheranism had developed quickly in 15 years since Martin Luther had published his 95 theses to the practices of the Roman church. Thanks to the new technology of the printing press, this list of objections had been widely read and attracted huge support. Grammer was involved in the emperor's talks to Nuremberg, sending regular reports back to the king and Cromwell, some of which were encoded knowledge about these military preparations was of great importance to, in England. Cranmer had taken the opportunity to get to know the leader, leader of the Lutheran movement in Nuremberg, Andreas Osiander. Cranmer and Osiander were able to converse in Latin, the international language of the Roman Catholic Church inherited from the Roman Empire that had conquered most of the known world in the time of Christ. They found they had similar approaches to interpreting the Bible, and they both enjoyed hunting. Osiander was preparing a description of worship for churches in Nuremberg, and also a catechism for young people to declare their faith. His work was based on Luther's writings, particularly on the small catechism that Luther had published in 1529 to explain his beliefs to ordinary members of the congregation. Cranmer was interested in these documents, many of which were in German, so he decided to learn German. Osiander suggested that his niece, Marguerite, would be a good teacher. The suggestion resulted in Cranmer and Marguerite spending many hours together, during the course of which they fell in love. Cranmer had wrestled with his feelings. He'd taken a clerical oath of celibacy, and at 21, Marguerite was half his age. But Osiander was married, as were other Protestants who'd been Catholic priests, including Martin Luther. Osiander and Luther had both taken the oath of celibacy. It seemed a natural assumption that in the near future, England would become Protestant and that priests would be allowed to be married. As for age, Luther had been 40 when he married and already had four children. So having first discussed the propriety of his action with her uncle, Cranmer proposed to Marguerite. To his private surprise, she had accepted his proposal. Osiander showed the extent of his approval by performing the marriage service. Marguerite was blue-eyed, fair-haired, slender, and almost as tall as Cranmer. They made an excellent couple. 
the marriage had to be in secret. The Protestants in Nuremberg would have no objection, but the Roman Catholic emperor would not have, have accepted a married priest as ambassador. Priests could have mistresses, but go, getting married was a step too far. As long as the emperor stayed in Nuremberg, the newly married couple could live together discreetly as man and wife. For the time being, the future could look after itself. Apart from learning about Osiander's personal work, Cranmer needed to extend his knowledge of the wider Protestant movement in Germany. A difficult situation had arisen that some Protestant leaders disagreed with Luther as to what beliefs in church services should replace Catholicism. And we'll resume that in our next sitting as we turn to Professor Jasper Ridley and the fiasco of the Prebendary's plot in 1543. It was now that the conservatives, we need a new pair of glasses here, that the conservatives made their famous attempt to send Cranmer to the tower. Some members of the council informed he that Henry that Cranmer was a heretic and that though no one dared come forward and give evidence against him in view of his high position, this evidence would be forthcoming if Cranmer were imprisoned. Henry agreed that Cranmer should be arrested at the council table the next day and sent to the tower. But that same night, he sent his favorite, Anthony Denny, who was a friend of the Reformation, to summon Cranmer from Lambeth. Cranmer rose from his bed and came to Henry in the gallery at Whitehall. Henry told him that he had agreed to the council's proposal to arrest him and asked Cranmer for his comments. It was more than 20 years later that Maurice recorded what Cranmer had told him about this midnight talk. But his version of what was said, even if not strictly accurate, gives a striking illustration of the impotent piet, primate and king who understood so well the nature of his own regime. Cranmer answered and most humbly thanked the king that it would please his highness to give him that warning beforehand, saying that he was very well content to be committed to the tower for the trial of his doctrine, so that he might be indifferently heard, as he doubted not, but that his majesty would see him so used. O oh Lord God, quoth king, what fond simplicity you have, so to permit yourself to be imprisoned that every enemy of yours may take vantage against you. Do you not think that if you have one, are once in prison, three or four false knaves will soon be procured to witness against you and condemn you? Which else now, being as your liberty, dare not open their lips or appear before your face? Not so, my lord, quoth the king. I have better regard unto you than to permit your enemies to so overthrow you. He gave Cranmer his ring and told him when he was arrested at the council next day. He must produce the ring and appeal to be heard by the king in person, for it is well known that the royal ring was given to those persons whom the king wished to grant this special privilege of appeal. We turn now to the next volume, Thomas Cranmer, churchman and scholar with Eben Duffy on popular religion and Luther. I'm sorry, Cranmer and popular religion. The same insistence on the objective power of sacred things and formulae and especially the sign of the cross to banish the devil, characterized the service of blessing salt and water performed before Mass each Sunday. Both salt and water were exercised with repeated signs of the cross, 
and the word vexorcism attribute to the substance is so hallowed actual power. The salt is to be the salvation of body and soul to all you who take it. And wherever you are sprinkled, let every delusion and wickedness and every craftiness of devilish cunning scatter and depart when called upon. The water was to acquire effectual power to cast out demons and drive away disease. It was to have such power not merely over people but over inanimate objects so that whatever in the houses or places of the faithful shall be sprinkled with it may be freed from all pollution and delivered from harm. By the repetition of that name, every invasion of the unclean spirit was turned away and the dread of the venomous serpent driven away. Similarly, at candlemas ceremonies, candles were solemnly blessed by virtue of the Holy Cross and thereby acquired the power wherever they were lit or set up to send the devil and all his ministers trembling away. Here at the heart of the liturgy, and not simply in the uninformed minds of ignorant peasants, was the assertion of an inexorable and compelling power inherent in the name and cross of Christ, whose fundamental pattern was derived from the liturgy of baptism. And we will turn to Leslie Williams' emblem of faith untouched. Cromwell has fallen. However, in the absence of Cromwell, Cranmer and Henry grew closer. The king serving as Cranmer's protector and friend when Cranmer's enemy sought to unseat him. Inexplicably attracted to a man vastly different than himself, Henry respected Cranmer's learning, his innocence and willingness to forgive his enemies. Unlike most courtiers, Cranmer did not seek riches or ambition or revenge, which inspired Henry to champion him against the wiles of his enemies. In an event incomprehensible today, two days after Cromwell's death, three Roman sympathizers and three Protestant heretics were executed. Barnes, Garrett, and Jerome were burned at Smithfield for reformist heresies. All three priests were drawn and quartered a few yards away for denying royal supremacy. Neither faction of the king's council dared stand up for their own. The message was clear. Too far on either side of the religious spectrum of Henry's beliefs meant death. The climate in 1540 also meant grave danger for Cranmer because the Henrician Catholics hoped he would fall with Cromwell. When people in the street shouted against Cromwell, they also bet thousands of pounds to hundreds that Cranmer would follow Cromwell to the tower. That summer, the Henrician Catholic Party peaked in their power. Two reactionaries took places, took the places of the reformers Latimer and Shaxton at Worcester and Salisbury, respectively. Stokesley, Bishop of London, died was replaced with a more perverse and zealous Bishop Edmund Burrow Bonner. Was that at Salisbury? With the death of Cromwell and defeat of Anne of Cleves, the reformers candidate for queen, the Roman party led by Norfolk pushed his niece, Catherine Howard, into Henry's favor. Gardner aided and abetted the scheme by feasting and entertaining Henry and Catherine at his palace at Southwark. With customary haste, Henry married Catherine in a private serb ceremony, July 28, the same day Cromwell fell. Nineteen days after convocation pronounced his marriage with Anne invalid, and the same day Cromwell was executed. No doubt grateful to Anne to have Anne out of the picture, 
Henry endowed her with estates valued at an enormous sum, 4,000 pounds a year, wealthy, free, and happy. Anne fared better than she would have either in Cleves or as Henry's wife. She remained on excellent terms with Henry, and when she died in 1557, was buried <clears throat> in Westminster Cathedral. German reformers, however, were horrified comparing Henry to Nero. Now for Mr. Art. Charles seems to have had suspicions of dangers ahead. At the end of 1549, Paul III died. He was succeeded by Julius III, who favored the emperor. Julius at once noticed that the council was to renew its session at Trent. Charles was well pleased, and at return, it was announced that the imperial diet that the decisions of the council would be enforced. The meaning of that could only be that the toleration of Lutheranism was to end. But Charles had reckoned without his host. The unexpected Maurice made a sudden swoop, scattered his troops, all but captured his person, incidentally stopped the proceedings of the council, and drove the emperor to make the Peace of Passau, which again secured the Protestants their liberties. The next year saw the death of Maurice and also Edward VI. By its close, negotiations had been opened for the reunion of the new Mary to Emperor's son Philip. In the following summer, 1554, the marriage was celebrated. A few months later, England was formally reconciled to Rome. Quick 30,000 flyover by Mr. Innes. We turn to salvaging the clause with Prof. Mack. And the fallout that happened between William Paget and Wiley Winchester. After the initial note in the register of the Privy Council's establishment, Cranmer's not recorded as turning up for meetings until 23 January 1541, after the eventful 1540s. It is likely that he was otherwise engaged mainly in presiding over the contentious work of the Doctrine Commission set up by the King at the beginning of April. In the end, neither of the April committees produced any immediate published result, probably because of the con constant seesawing and political point scoring over the next three years. The finished document produced by the Committee on Ceremonial survives in two slightly variant manuscripts and was only resurrected by John Strip in the late 17th century. It was designed in homily form like the Bishop's Book and was a sustained attempt to defend traditional liturgical ceremonies by giving them a didactic purpose a conservative hijacking of an evangelical strategy of the 1530s. Yet the evangelical members of the committee, Goodrich and Holgate, secured the omission of any discussion of the Eucharistic sacrifice, and the document included the alarming description of the Mass as a remembrance of the Passion of Christ, whose most precious body and blood is there consecrated. There are also some significant variations between the two manuscripts, which show signs of the committee's disagreements. The latter version leans toward the evangelicals, omitting a defense of candle in the ceremonies and including condemnation of exorcisms, which do not properly spell out the doctrine that sins are remitted exclusively 
through the merits of Christ's passion. The fact that this evangelical version of the text is later than the other may well be an indication of why the committee never delivered the goods. Perhaps conservative members saw that it was swinging away from their control. 1541 and 1544. Now for Margot Johnson on Cranmer and Liturgy. Then music. The main sources were the Serum Processionale, you're talking about the 1544 litany, based on a Greek liturgy brought to England about 700, with many saints' names omitted. Petitions grouped, versicles and responses added. A Latin, the Latin litany of Luther, a collect from the Latin version of the liturgy of St. Chrysostom and some editions of Cranmer himself. The litany in English was first sung in procession in St. Paul's Cathedral on St. Luke's Day, 18 October 1545. It was published as an exhortation unto prayer to be read in every church of four processions. Also a litany with suffrages to be said or sung in the time of the said processions. Of the seven editions known to have been published in October, Tavo in 1544, three have music and four are without, whilst another undated but probably of the same year is 16 something in format and has no music. Two more editions appeared in 1545 without music and further two editions also lacking music were printed in 1546. The original music consisted of simple syllabic melodies, but soon the English litany was sung to uncomplicated four part settings. It's been conjunctured that Merbeck was associated with Cranmer producing the litany and adapted the music to Cranmer's text. Merbeck's talent was already recognized through his own surviving works, two Latin motets, an English carol, and a polyphonic mass for five voices. Later in 1544, Cranmer wrote to Henry VIII about verse translations of several more processions. He suggested they might be set to some devout and solemn note, and that they should not be full of notes, but as near as may be for every syllable a note, so that it may be sung distinctly and devoutly. He was referring to the practice usual at the period in connection with canticles, but laying down no rule, and alluded to his attempt, not very successful, to translate the Latin hymn Salve Sancta Dies into English. Let's turn now to Professor Hughes, a theology of the English reformers. <clears throat> We turn to chapter 5 on ministry. We just finished preaching and worship. John Jewell, we are but God's servants, God's messengers, appointed to lead and guide you. Thus, therefore, ought every man to esteem the preachers of God's gospel as messengers, as servants, as ministers of Christ. The ministry. We've seen in the preceding chapter how the reformers reinstated evangelical preaching and gave it a place of honor as God's primary instrument of salvation. The central place which preaching enjoyed in, in their doctrine of the ministry is nowhere more strikingly demonstrated than in the organ of the Church of England. Prior to the Reformation and still today in the Roman Catholic Church, the emphasis is or in ordination is overwhelmingly on the sacerdotal function of ministry. Indeed, that the minister is regarded as essentially an offerer of sacrifice 
is apparent from the title itself, Sacerdose, of the office to which he is ordained. In the ordination service, the bishop defines the foremost duty of the priest, Sacerdose, as to offer the sacrifice of the Mass. But he vests himself with the chasuble with the words, Receive the sacerdotal vestment. He prays that an immaculate benediction he may transform bread into wine and wine into the body and blood of Christ and anoints the hands of the candidate with oil for this express purpose and then delivers to him a patent on which is an unconsecrated host and chalice containing wine mixed with water with these words. Receive power to offer sacrifice to God and to celebrate the Mass for both the living and the dead. The delivery of the instruments of his ministry, Porectio Instrumentorum, together with the authorization to function as a sacrificing priest, constitutes the essence of valid ordination in the Roman Rite. The English Ordinal. Reformers, however, rejected the whole concept of Christian ministry as a sacerdotal priesthood. In the first ordinal published in 1550, not only the bread and cup, but also significantly, the Bible is delivered to the candidate, who is given authority to preach the word and to minister the holy sacraments. The candidate, in short, is being ordained to the ministry of word and sacraments. There is no mention of the offering of sacrifices. All the ceremonial referred to above is omitted, but in the 1552 ordinal, which in all essentials is the same as that of the 1662 in the present prayer book, the handing over of the paten and chalice to the ordained is discontinued so that any possible excuse for misconstruction or misrepresentation may be removed. The sole instrument of the ministry is now the Bible, not, however, that it is regarded as no longer a ministry of sacraments, but the sacraments, says visible words, are rightly included within the ministry of the word. Thus the bishop still says to him, Take thou authority to preach the word of God and to minister as holy, the holy sacraments. The prayer at the end of the service is focused on the word of God. The Heavenly Father is desired to send his blessings on those who are newly ordained, that they may be clothed with righteousness, that thy word spoken by their mouths may have such success that it may never be spoken in vain and that we may have grace to hear and receive what they shall deliver out of thy most holy word, or agreeable to the same as means of our salvation. Here we end this edition of Cranmer Readings. God's glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.